when we're talking about relative extrema, we're looking for those points where we're either at like a high, a high point on the graph or a low point on the graph. And either way, my first step is going to be to set the derivative equal to zero. So I'm looking for those places where the graph flattens out. And then relative to those points, what's kind of happening on either side. So my derivative here, I am looking at 15x to the fourth minus 15x squared plus zero, if you like. I try to make the numbers work out pretty nicely. So when we set that equal to zero, I can factor out a 15x squared, which would leave me with x squared minus one, which means to get it like totally factored, I'd have that x minus one and the x plus one. I do a number line. Some people do a chart, doesn't really matter, but somehow you wanna kind of organize your thoughts here. So the values that make my derivative equal to zero are zero, one, and negative one. So these are all critical numbers in sort of the language of our textbook. Um, I'm careful to call them critical numbers and not critical points. They're critical points as long as they're within the domain of the function. So then I could like go back and check, oh yeah, nothing's gonna go wrong domain-wise with my function. So they're critical numbers, which means they are X values that could lead me to critical points. But from there, personally, I'm going number line. So I'm gonna draw a number line and remember to label it as my derivative. Now that's really just for me to remember, where am I gonna plug test points in? So I'm looking at zero, negative one and one. Now, because my pre-calc skills are strong, I can fill this number line in super quick. And I know that this ought to look like positive, a negative, a negative, and a positive. If your pre-calc skills don't allow you to imagine what this graph would look like, then we are gonna have to pick some test points to plug stuff in. Now remember in each of these intervals, I only care about whether the derivative is positive or negative. So don't get too hung up on actually plugging numbers in. And I prefer to look at the factored form because it's easier for me to like focus in on just looking at the positive or negative. So if I picked a test point over here, like two, and I plug it into my derivative, 15 is always positive. X squared, doesn't matter what I plug in, that's gonna be positive. So I've got a positive, two minus one, that's positive, and two plus one is also positive. So there's my positive, which means that over here, I know that my graph is going up. I picked a test point in here between zero and one. It doesn't really matter if you prefer fractions or decimals, but again, I'm gonna focus on positive or negative, not get hung up on the numbers. When I plug in the one half, when I square it, it's positive. One half minus one is gonna be negative and one half plus one would be positive. So overall, that's my negative number. If I chose negative one half, super similarly, when I square it, it's positive. Negative one half minus one is negative. And negative one half plus one is positive. So overall, that's a negative and I'm going down. And if I picked something over here, it really doesn't matter. You could put negative 1,000 if you wanted to. Um, I'll just pick negative two. Negative two squared is positive. Negative two minus one is negative. And negative two plus one is also negative. So overall, that gives me a positive. So if I think about this in the context of like writing this graph along, I was going up, then down, then I keep going down, then I'm going back up. Well, if I was going up and then back down, I know that negative one has to be a relative maximum. So there's some subtlety to how questions get asked, and I've definitely been seeing this on 
web work, a lot of times when we ask for the relative extrema, we should just go ahead and give the X and Y coordinates. And if you have any doubt on an exam situation, just go ahead and write out X equals negative one, Y equals, just give them both, then you're giving everything that you could possibly give here. So to get the Y value when X is negative one and actually give that coordinate, I have to go back to the original function. I know that if I plug in negative one to the derivative, I get zero. But when I plug in negative one to the original function, I probably don't, or maybe I do, I don't know. If I plug in negative one, negative one to the fifth is negative. So I'm at negative three. I'm just gonna go ahead and write it down. I'm at negative three. That'll be a negative one, but then times negative five. So plus five and plus two. So I think my coordinate there would be negative one. Um, what's that? Seven minus three, four. And I'm gonna list that as a relative max. Now for the coordinate of one, for the X coordinate of one, I was going down and then back up again. So that must've been a relative minimum. So when X equals one, if I go to plug that back in into the Y, I'm gonna have three minus five plus two or coordinate of one comma, that's a negative zero. And that would be my relative min. I'm gonna pause there for a second in case there are questions. And then we're gonna, and then I'm gonna ask like 12 more things about this function. Not seeing questions in the chat, but if something occurs to you, you can always put it in there. Um, other questions we might be asked, right? So here I asked us to find all relative extrema. Maybe another question that we would get asked. Oh yeah. Um, so more things. Would we plug in? Would you also find out zero and plug in? Okay. So there's a question about whether I need to plug in zero. That is a really good question. Zero is, I claim, not a relative max, nor is it a relative min. And the reason is that if I think about what this is telling me about the graph, my graph was going down, but then it kept going down. And I'm only gonna be at a relative max or a min if there's like a change in whether I'm increasing or decreasing. If I'm going down and then I keep going down, I didn't hit a max or a min. Now the other question about why I was doing this stuff is because that was the question we were trying to answer um, was to find those relative extrema. So I need to know the coordinates for that relative extrema and then whether it's a max or a min. Now there's a question in there about inflection points and I'll get there in a second, but my first derivative can't tell me about the inflection points, but yes, I do suspect that zero is probably an inflection point. Um, so negative one. Oh, okay. So again, this is kind of a vocabulary thing. Um, if I ask for the relative maximum, I'm asking you for the Y value. If I ask you where the relative maximum occurs, I'm either asking you for the X value or the coordinate. But if I ask for the actual extrema, so if I'm asking for the maximum or the minimum, the answer ought to be a Y value. Now there's a little bit of subtlety there in terms of how you're inputting stuff into web work, which is why for me, anytime I'm asked this question on a test, I'm just gonna, I'm giving you both. I'm giving you the X value and the Y value covering it all, making sure I've given you what you wanted. I think maybe that answers all the questions in the chat. We'll see, keep them coming. Um, but other questions we might've been asked, 
we might have been asked to find the intervals intervals where f of x was increasing or decreasing. So if I'm looking for where we're increasing and decreasing, first of all, I'm always going to give open intervals. We're always going to have parentheses on these, not brackets. Because if you think about it, at our endpoints, the derivatives are zero. It's not positive or negative. So if I'm looking for the intervals where we're increasing, I am looking at negative infinity to negative one and also from one to infinity. And then if I were looking at where we're decreasing, I'm gonna go from negative one to zero and from zero to one. I'm punching that hole out at zero and that part is important, but the value of my derivative is zero at zero. So it, it's not a positive or a negative value. So we're not gonna include it in either space. Question. So I bet zero is gonna end up being an inflection point when we get to our second derivative. That's typically what's happening if on our first derivative, we're looking at a place where the value is zero, but the signs were not changing on either side. Um, you can totally do this with a sign chart instead of a number line. I think that using the number line has one for me, the one advantage of a number line is if I'm going to have to sketch a graph in the end, I kind of already have things lined up where I want them to be. But other than that, if you're quick with a sign chart, totally use a sign chart. Doesn't, doesn't matter at all. No one's going to care. Yeah. Um, okay. I didn't originally ask this question, but I could have also asked us to find any points of inflection. Well, if we're looking for those points of inflection, those are going to be, I've got three criteria. One of them is right there in the name. It says point of inflection. So I always wanna be careful that whatever value I'm giving is part of the domain, right? It's not a point if it doesn't have both an X and a Y value, which happens in a few of the web work problems. Um, the other part is this is gonna be a place where the second derivative is equal to zero, but that's not enough either. My second derivative has to be zero and the concavity has to be different on either side of that point. So I'm going to go ahead and get our second derivative going. Some of you may have already done it on your paper. I don't know. But my second derivative, so I'm coming back up here to my first derivative. Let's see, 4 times 15 sounds like 60 x cubed. 2 times 15, that'll be a negative 30 x. And if I set that equal to 0, Looks like I can factor out a 30x, and then I'd be left with 2x squared minus 1. Well, these numbers are a little bit messier, but I've got x equals 0. And this is going to give me that x is equal to plus or minus one over the square root of two. Good times. So if I choose to do a number line, I'm gonna label my number line for my second derivative. I'm looking at zero positive one over square root of two, negative one over the square root of two, 
And now I'd be thinking about plugging in some test points. Should I give everybody a minute to try plugging in test points or should I just do them together because the numbers are messy? I got some votes for together on Zoom. Um, so for sure, if I plug in something really big, everything's positive. So I'm not gonna think too hard on that part. And if that second derivative is positive, I know that we should be concave up. And if I plug in something over here that's negative, like, I don't know, negative 10. Well, negative 10 squared, that's gonna be positive. 200 minus, that's all kinds of positive. 30 times negative 10, I'm looking at a negative times a positive here. So that's negative. Now comes the fun part. So let's say that this does happen on a test and I don't have a calculator and I've got to figure out something that's in there. One over the square root of two. I don't know, but here are some things I do know. Um, just like number sense wise, the square root of two is bigger than one, but less than two, which means that if I make all of those fractions, then one over one is bigger than one over the square root of two, which is bigger than one over two. I don't know if that was helpful, but at least it gives me a sense that one over the square root of two is somewhere between a half and one. Did I do that right? Yeah, because square root of two is like 1.44. Yeah, 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 we're good, we're good. Sorry, I started questioning my math for a second there. Which means if it's somewhere between a half and one, I know that I can plug in a half. It's bigger than a half, whatever it is. So I can still use the, I can still use a friendly-ish number and plug in a half and negative one half. If I plug in a half, thing out front is gonna be positive. Inside, I've got, one half squared, which is one fourth, two times a fourth is a half minus one, that's negative. If I plug in negative one half, I'm gonna get exactly the same thing inside. It's just gonna be a negative out in front also. So I'll have a negative times a negative and this will be positive. So if I'm looking for points of inflection, it looks like I've got three of them on this graph. Now I'm gonna show everybody what I think is a useful trick if you don't get a calculator. And that is, we're gonna save ourselves some time. We're gonna be right, but we might lose a point or two and that's okay. So our points of inflection are happening at, zero comma f of zero, negative one over the square root of two comma f of negative one over the square root of two and one over the square root of two comma f of one over the square root of two.